um, okay, sir. Good, sir. good afternoon all dignitaries friends students and one and all uh, today we all have assembled here virtually to have a discussion on the theme technology and innovation under Awas for Samvad program as part of the Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban in association with Andhra Pradesh, um, uh, Andhra Pradesh um, Township and Infrastructure Development Corporation and uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs in the Ajatika Amrut Mahotso. I, Dr. Uma Shankar Basna, Associate Professor, Department of Architecture, School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada, deem it my privilege for this opportunity to be the coordinator and moderator of this insightful workshop. Audible is the collective responsibility of the government, academicians, and industry. In view of this, today we have our guest speakers and industry academy experts in conversation with us on the theme technology and innovation. Now, to achieve the goal of housing for all, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana Urban, Urban Mission under Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, is conducting workshops and seminars, Avas for Samvad, with an aim to deliberate, discuss, disseminate, and share learnings and knowledge on housing in urban spaces uh, these discussions are among multiple stakeholders belonging to varied streams of learning and practices example uh, engineering urban community development planning finance and many other stakeholders who make the reality of uh, people uh, owning their uh, dream home now this workshop is is to primarily to discuss and debate about the technology and innovation approach which is a need for the existing real estate to achieve housing for all this workshop will sensitize audience about industry and academic perspective of technology and innovation it is to see that affordable housing is not a dream but a reality it is to affirm that india can develop livable housing and thereby livable cities. It is to integrate housing with effective innovations in construction technology to create affordable and eco-friendly habitat, ultimately to make our cities sustainable. Now with this, I would like to invite the chief coordinator of this workshop, the head of department of planning, Professor Dr. Abdul uh, Razak Muhammad sir, to deliver his welcome address. Before this address, I take this opportunity to introduce Professor Abdul Razak, sir. Uh, professor Dr. Abdul Razak, sir, is currently working as a professor and HOD at the Department of Planning uh, of School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada. He is an urban and regional planner with a basic master's degree in sociology, executive master's in e-governance from Ecole Polytechnic, Luzane, Switzerland. Dr. Razak sir has earned his PhD in urban and regional planning from RMIT University, Melbourne, Australia, and uh, uh, MPhil sociology from University of Madras, uh, masters in uh, town and country planning from School of Architecture and Planning, Anna University, Chennai. And uh, Professor Dr. Razak sir has specialized in the subject areas such as urban and rural sociology, urban and regional planning, environmental education, tourism planning, disaster management, universal design and acceptable accessibility participatory planning research methodology governance and e-governance professor dr rajak sir has worked uh, in several capacities in his vast academic experience including in australia france and united states of america he had widely published numerous research articles in national and international journals and at many national and international conferences Sir, uh, sir, I have written several book chapters and resource books and received a number of awards and is a member of many professional bodies in India and abroad. With this, I welcome the chief coordinator of this workshop to deliver the welcome address, please. Sir, Dr. Abdul Rajak Mohammed, sir. To you. Thank you, Dr. Umar Basina. Thanks for the uh, introduction. First of all, uh, I would like to extend uh, 
my warm welcome to all the participants to this virtual workshop on uh, technology and innovation. So as uh, Dr. Basina has briefed about this particular uh, context of a series of workshops organized by the Central Ministry with the cooperation of the state government and education institutions. So here I would like to uh, first of all welcome to our uh, director, Dr. Professor Meenachi Jain, who has extended her inspiration and for cooperation and support to conduct today's workshop, or also we had one on the 25th of last month. The guest speakers, uh, uh, Subhashish Das, IFS, Director of Housing for All, Minister of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. Also welcome, Mr. Sridhar Chiturti IAS, uh, the Managing Director of Andhra Pradesh Town and Infrastructure Development Corporation Limited. So the guest speakers are uh, extending their um, ideas on how this particular uh, PMAY urban at the national and the state level experiences. I would like to welcome also the expert speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Subhatra Jutabhatia, former uh, head Department of Architecture and Regional Planning in an Institute of uh, Correct Food. And Dr. B. Sahi Bhushan is a principal architect and planner from BSP Architecture, Mysore, and Professor Mandu Mani, a Center for uh, Sustainable Technology, Center for Product Design and Manufacturing, Indian Institute of Social Science, Bangalore. These expert speakers are intended to share their rich intellectual as well as uh, academic experience on the universally shared uh, idea of uh, sustainable development goals, especially focusing on the methods to make housing climate resilient and adopting environmental friendly practices, managing and upgrading technology and skills towards housing, and sustainability challenges in built environment, technology matters. So these are the prime areas of concern today, very much up to the theme of the technology and innovation to the housing for all. So I am happy to welcome the coordinators of the workshop, Dr. Uma Shankar Basina, Associate Professor, and uh, Mr. Uh, Sandos, Assistant Professor, Department of Architecture, also the other uh, coordinators, uh, Mr. Jayes and uh, Sumania. Also welcome my faculty colleagues, staff, student friends, invited officials, beneficiaries, and ladies and gentlemen. So before I leave this uh, forum to the moderator, I would like to stress upon a uh, couple of points to, 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 to understand that the, the state of uh, the inclusive housing is a, is a global and uh, local context. As we know that India housed uh, diverse communities uh, with uh, multiple lifestyle, climate regions, building design, construction technology, including material, material used, which very well reflect their houses they live. Also, we know that increasing urban-based living environment in India is essential to have technological innovation towards safe and healthy living houses and neighborhood. So as we know that the components of uh, PMAYU uh, uh, urban includes a new emerging construction technologies and opportunities and construction practices in India and the role of uh, indigenous housing as well as innovative construction technologies in mass housing, making housing climate resilient, adopting environment friendly practices and also, finally, the measures of quality control and assurance in housing projects. So with this small little introduction, I, as a coordinator of this program, I, all the participants, I ensure you are all uh, that it is really a rare opportunity and keep yourself uh, engaged to the benefit, even a small idea as a takeaway from today's webinar where the intellectual professional idea will be delivered by the expert team. 
Thank you once again. Over to Basina, Dr. Basina. Yes, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Professor Dr. Abdul Rajab Muhammad, sir, for welcoming uh, all, all the part, all the participants. Uh, now, may I call upon, may I invite uh, the convener of this workshop and uh, the director of School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada, Professor Dr. Menakshi Jain, ma'am, to kindly address this uh, August gathering. Ma'am, but before that, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce uh, um, uh, Professor Dr. Menakshi Jain, ma'am. Uh, ma'am has been working as a director uh, in the School of Planning and Architecture, Vijayawada, and National Institute, an Institute of National Importance since 2016. Uh, um, um, Professor Menakshi Jain, ma'am, is from architecture background with specialization in landscape architecture and sustainable development. Having more than 26 years of experience in both in academics and industry, uh, she is the author of the book on landscape architecture entitled Landscape Architecture, History, Ecology and Patterns and published nearly 50 research, article, research articles and book chapters. Ma'am has also undertaken the designing and planning of various architectural and uh, landscape projects. And Professor Dr. Menakshi, ma'am, uh, served as the chairperson of, for International Conference on Urbanism and Green Architecture at National Institute of Technology, Hamirpur, in October 2010. And re ma'am had received commendation awards like uh, a research award from A3 Foundation, Panchkula, for carrying out research work on sustainable development in the remote area of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, Ma'am has also received the commendation certificate for carrying out the community service scheme effectively and for successfully carrying out the responsibility as Dean Planning and Development at National Institute of Technology, Hamirpur. Uh, Ma'am was the recipient of the best faculty award for the year 2006 to 2007 instituted by the National Institute of Technology, Hamirpur. Um, uh, Ma'am, uh, now may I request you to uh, address the August gathering. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basina, and the uh, coordinator of this program, Chief uh, Coordinator, Professor Abdul Razak. We have the presence of Coordinator Santosh Pedagadi. Uh, then we have Jayesh, we have Samaina. I can see only this many people, but I am being uh, learned from your paper that we have. Uh, so, Vesh Das Ji is also present. Uh, it will be there. But in case he's there, I welcome him as well. Shashi Bhushan Ji, I, can, as I uh, came to know from the name itself only. He's also available here with us. And we are many involved into this very, very pertinent issue that is Awas Pe Samvar. And uh, we started this program with the two other coordinators. So, Maina is already sitting here. And uh, uh, along with uh, Samaina Jayesh, uh, was responsible in coordinating that program. And we took this uh, workshop into two parts. And this is the second part, which is also very important. It's a technology and innovation. And what I feel is in uh, urban housing, and this, this program is in collaboration. I should not ignore that also. That it is in collaboration with AP TEDCO and Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. So we are collaborating with them. Uh, to, un uh, to understand and to discuss the various nuances in the housing, housing shortage. Because what I was reading through the papers that we have the shortage of 56%. I mean, it's in 29 million housing shortage is there. Okay, and the paradox of the situation is such that in one side, we have the shortage of housing. And on the other side, we have the abundance of housing which are unoccupied. Such cases are also there. So I would just, you know, suggest and probably uh, we can have a discussion also later on. We can retrofit also certain houses, such certain those kind of houses or housing, which are not that much user friendly. I mean, we can make them climatic responsive. We can make them affordable. Maybe we can make them available closer to the workplace. We, we have to see which category of people they suit and accordingly we can lower down the prices and accordingly they should be made available. I'm sure government is doing a lot many things with the uh, lottery scheme and the housing. Uh, I get certain labors and they say today, you know, the lottery was out and my number is there. I'm sure Andhra Pradesh government already has been doing uh, quite a lot about it. But then faster, you know, there is a faster construction of the housing is important, but the retrofitting is also equally important so that we do not make certain houses which are redundant which are not being occupied. So they have to be inclusive. We have to take care of the health. 
we have to make them well oriented we have to make them well ventilated well airy so that the people are able to uh, work inside them and even the community you know those kind of feeling should also come when they stay into the housing so multi storied may not be a solution of course we save up on the space there are certain things are there but how do we make same number of houses with a low settlement because india especially vijayawada is a hot and humid climate and how do we make the staggered arrangement of those housing and how do we make them climatic friendly probably those features are to be seen before prior you know we take some decisions and a mass survey can be taken up to undertake this and then accordingly see to it what are the categories of the people what are the work profile of the people who are have facing the shortfall who are you know not provided with the adequate housing so that the people are not even you know staying in the houses so that their work efficiency also improves and their health also improves with these words i will not say much because we have already the experts i heard uh, professor montomani is going to be there and then we have various experts from ap tibco and then uh, yeah ministry of housing and urban affairs i'm sure there will be expert there there too and then we have chatta padaya ji also is there so uh, i'm sorry uh okay so uh, i'm sure with the deliberation because today's topic uh, about the innovation technology is also very very important last time we discussed uh, inclusive housing uh, i mean along with the housing your transport will be be important your transit oriented development will be important whether we need to build the housing or not or whether uh, we need to uh, i mean how much intervention of the infrastructure is required how much and the industry input is required the skill technologies to be used the cultural issues to be touched so that the people are close to the culture as well with this a few words i end up my words i'm sure many topics have been covered here and many topics will be covered and especially today's program is very very important where technology and innovation will be carried it out and school of planning and architecture vijayawada uh, despite of having you know certain shortcoming in the earlier years we are having now full courses are there with us uh, we are having the various courses urban design uh, conservation landscape architecture uh, then urban and digital planning conservation so we have seven disciplines in the master they they are capable and uh, you know they can provide the different kind of solutions in the different kind of nuances when we are discussing and i'm sure uh, we will collaborate further this is the initiative we can take and then this is just the start and we can surely uh, have a very very fruitful discussion and deliberation in the process thank you so much for no. me this opportunity yeah. thank you ma'am for your uh, kind and encouraging and inspiring address i'm sure that these words would trigger many young minds present here and uh, give a fruitful direction and a way forward uh, thank you ma'am um, now uh, i i take this opportunity to introduce uh, shri suvarshish das ji IFS, uh, who is the director uh, of Housing for All, as part of Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, Government of India. Actually, the the triggering point or the reason why this particular workshop has been initiated, along with uh, Andhra Pradesh uh, Tourism, uh, uh, sorry, Andhra Pradesh uh, uh, Township and Infrastructure Development Corporation. So, um, I I briefly introduce, uh, sir. Uh, he is the chief guest of today's program. Uh, now, um, Uh, Sri Subhashish Das Ji is an uh, Indian Forest Service officer of 2005 batch. Sir has served as divisional forest officer and buffer of Manas National Park um, and then Kajiranga National Park and other forest divisions. His contribution in involving community in dealing with man elephant conflict conflict was highly praised and then he has many publications to his credit as well and then recently uh, sir has authored one book kajiranga the Medi uh, the magical wilderness and then he served as a state mission director assam for pradhan mantri awas yojana urban and then national urban livelihood mission for last two years and uh, since june 2021 uh, he sir is working in the capacity of director housing for all ministry of housing and urban affairs uh, now um, uh, because uh, as uh, we were informed that uh, sri subhashish das sir is uh, busy with the uh, prime minister sir's uh, lucknow visit so therefore if any uh, any of his representative otherwise 
uh, we will move forward sir i mean now um, and then um, uh, next i invite uh, shri sridhar chitturi sir uh, ias uh, and uh, managing director andhra pradesh township and infrastructure development corporation to deliver the inaugural address i will uh, briefly introduce him sir kind hello and then uh, initially sir was selected as uh, ips indian police service in 1995 but then uh, sir has uh, become he has advanced to as an indian administrative services uh, from 2006 onwards and then sir has worked in various capacities like uh, project director drda varangal and special officer outer ring road project uh, hmda hyderabad and then uh, project director cmro project um and special commissioner ap housing board hyderabad commissioner public enterprises department secretary ap information commission um uh, and then with this uh, i invite uh, uh, shri sridhar chitturi sir to deliver his uh, inaugural address sir thank you sir please over to you okay, sir good afternoon good afternoon all am i audible and visible kumar shankar person why Uh, yes sir you can continue yes yes, yes, yes sir you are audible and visible sir kindly sir thank okay, you okay. yes so let me uh, introduce uh, uh, today's uh, topic main theme uh, has uh, uh, taken a larger shape in andhra pradesh uh, it all started in uh, 2015 uh, with government of india giving the support to all the states and union territories of uh, taking up housing on a massive scale mm -hmm. with a objective of uh, creating 1.2 crores of houses for the poor in india so the government of india under pm ay prime minister avas yojana has extended 1.5 lakhs per unit of subsidy to all the states and uh, union territories so it is it was up to every state and union territory to design uh, their own uh, uh, team of uh, carrying out the housing how to they do and i believe most of the states have done a big uh, huge uh, demand survey of the poor who require actually require a house so for example in andhra pradesh when we conducted a survey uh, we, we got a demand of 12 lakh 12 lakh houses so we asked government of india uh, to sanction this and uh, fortunately they have sanctioned 5 lakh 7 lakhs and when it uh, came up for uh, execution okay 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 it is all no matter the new one will be there you two will be there okay there was a lot of uh, discussion for at least one and a half year how to carry out this massive uh, housing um, venture so who are going to implement it uh, whether it should be centralized uh, procurement should be centralized or uh, individuals should be given a free hand to construct their own house so finally in 2018 when elections were approaching so the government uh, in a very uh, it was not having time to start up the housing on a large scale for example uh, we were uh, supposed to construct 5 lakh houses in 2018 and uh, we'll, uh, in 2000 by the target was 2019 we should hand over the houses to the public so then uh, uh, the political will actually i should say uh, is a must in adopting uh, uh, innovative technologies like we adopted share wall technology so this is a monolithic uh, construction technology which is gaining a lot of popularity and uh, it really required a lot of courage and uh, you know where this technology will lead us to and uh, the decision taken then resulted today in uh, building up 2.6 lakh houses in the g plus 3 pattern i would like to share a ppt with you to show what we have actually constructed so this is a very huge uh, and uh, massive uh, venture in andhra pradesh uh, and uh, i should say more than the officers it is the political will that has enabled uh, uh, to kick start housing because for 2 lakhs and 5 lakh houses share wall technology is the only solution of course 
because conventionally it would take us uh, three years and uh, with this technology we have taken only uh, one point uh, I mean 18 months to uh, complete the houses of course we are in uh, midway I will tell you other factors also what uh, we should uh, take care of before adopting technology for such massive housing ventures so today we stand uh, 50 to 60 percent midway we are not at uh, completed because of financial uh, problems and mobilization of uh, loans from public and also from uh, banks so we are a little bit uh, struggling and uh, anyhow by the end of uh, 2023 8 9 first first open trade. Okay, so you can view yeah, the Are you able to see the buildings, please? We are seeing the file folder, sir. Okay. Oh. Yes. Oh. Because in a, it is very interesting in Andhra Pradesh. We have come up with like gated communities. You must be familiar with gated communities for the middle class and the higher middle class. But in Andhra Pradesh, we have built up gated communities for the poor. Now it is visible, sir. So this is uh, in Bhimvaram. You are seeing 10,000 houses in 101 acres spread across. So this is the green field. We have acquired land. Close, rather. Is it clear? Are the houses clear? Zoom, yes, sir. Uh, it could be on presentation mode, sir. So that uh, maybe. Oh, presentation mode is not coming. Yes, sir. So when I uh, joined this project, uh, I was, uh, you know, uh, taken aback uh, whether I could uh, face this challenge. Uh, look at the massive construction of it. Okay, go to other slides. So these are the colonies we have built up with share wall technology in less than uh, 18 months in the entire state. This is for Nellur with parts also. And we have taken uh, care to select only the reputed uh, uh, companies like LNT, uh, Tata's, NCC uh, and all. So they have invested and uh, of course at a cost and this is the initial stage of construction you are uh, watching. So a lot of uh, uh, investment uh, has gone into it. Uh, so we have so far spent uh, 11,000 crores and yet we have to spend 10,000 crores. So these are the latest pictures available to you which are uh, on, on the verge of handing over. So these colonies uh, we are going to uh, create for the public well said uh, come out of the presentation so what i want to tell the uh, participants uh, is technology is one thing adoption is a second thing once you get hold of technology it requires a lot of political will because uh, frankly speaking officers we only can suggest government to adopt uh, this technology the government of the day, in order to uh, construct in a rapid manner, has adopted the share wall technology and we have succeeded partly. So for massive housing, share wall technology appears to be very successful. And the other aspect of uh, PMAY, where there is a lot of scope for uh, share wall technology is the BLC. The PMAY has a second component, which is beneficiary led uh, uh, construction, individual houses. Andhra Pradesh, we take pride in uh, uh, informing the participants that the present government has uh, given free of cost uh, patas of one cent and one and a half cent in urban areas to 30 lakh poor people, poor uh, families, 30 lakh houses. So imagine 1.2 crores is the target for the entire country set by government of India in 2015 out of which 30 lakh houses were sanctioned to Andhra Pradesh means uh, it carries uh, more than 20% of the housing in 
entire country so now the present government is taking up 15 lakh houses that, that also in the form of layouts exclusive uh, gated community kind of a structure you will visualize and uh, the investment per acre is going to be around 52 lakhs per acre so this is matching uh, uh, some of the uh, urban development authority approved layouts like that so it is a, a huge challenge of course for the government and uh, this is where uh, uh, i am talking about conventional technology uh, being pressed into uh, service uh, during the course of uh, this uh, session uh, i would like to draw the attention of the participants to involve themselves in uh, the housing uh, construction uh, in andhra pradesh so uh, at 17000 locations we are going to construct layouts of houses for the poor so there is lot of scope for introducing share wall technology i have explained that in ahp part that is affordable housing partnership we have constructed 2.6 lakhs the images which i have just seen now the present government is taking up 30 lakh such colonies for independent houses so which is only up to 340 sft Uh, in magnitude so here the options are given to public as well as uh, uh, district administration there is no centralized procurement uh, it is uh, tendering out uh, the colonies to uh, major players here uh, there is a lot of scope for uh, uh, youngsters particularly architects who can come up with uh, share wall technology a limited form work uh, which we, uh, we regularly see in youtube so it's a lot of promotions uh, being uh, the technology is being promoted they can experiment uh, in andhra pradesh they can come up with a proposal that they can take up uh, 500 houses 400 houses with uh, innovative technology and uh, mostly all the technologies are aiming to introduce share wall technology or monolithic uh, stru structures on because uh, overnight we can construct houses for uh, uh, such massive housing effect so during the course of uh, this session uh, please concentrate uh, the possibility of you participating in andhra pradesh by uh, giving practical shape to your ideas say uh, you all uh, uh, i learn or uh, i understand that uh, are eager to you know uh, prescribe what sort of technology is uh, applicable so we as administrators uh, take uh, simple uh, technology which is latest and try to implement it across the state so like that if any one of you come up and adopt a district so uh, taking some layouts to introduce your technology you are welcome so with this uh, few uh, practical uh, inputs so and uh, uh, highlighting what sort of technology the state is going through to complete 30 lakh houses so i find uh, today's topic of innovation and uh, technology a very apt and uh, very relevant uh, uh, aspect of uh, uh, modern housing uh, challenges we are having in the country and i hope everyone of you contribute to this massive housing efforts that the government are trying to achieve and i wish you all the best thank you thank you thank you sir thank you sridhar sir for the enlightening uh, and uh, very practical and uh, how we can actually a uh, path to bridge uh, the uh, shortage of housing especially the affordable housing and then you were stressing on the share wall technology for massive housing construction is definitely uh, will be taken up uh, i am sure that uh, many uh, <coughs> industrial and uh, industry led people would be uh, adopting these things sir and uh, also the beneficiary led construction and affordable housing in partnership uh, these definitely would give a very way forward to the overall um, achievement of housing for all and uh, we should we matlab uh, we are sure that uh, andhra pradesh state would uh, definitely give a Uh, as a good uh, example and as a good case study for 
uh, many to adopt sir thank you sir for your kind uh, grace and uh, sharing your uh, 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 experiences with us thank you sir um, now uh, uh, moving on i would i would like to uh, request uh, uh, ms somaina islari ji to play the uh, ministry of urban uh, ministry of housing and urban affairs video please. Sound is not. Uh, you are not able to hear the uh, audio, sir. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. Maybe I was unmuted. That's why I just unmuted. I'll play again. Are you? Oh. Ah. Is it audible now, sir? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes. yes. Okay. Pradesh Prabhutvam Pura Paripalana Mariyu Pattanabhi Vruddhi Sakha Andhisthonna Varam Vedal Andariki Pakka Illu Sthalam Nivasam Leni Varihi Illa Keta Illu Sthalam Unna Lapidar Lagu Prabhutvam Pagaswamiyan Do Gruhanirmanam Sakala Sadupayarato, Atunathana Technology Tho, PM AY Mayasar Jagannan Nanagar, Turpu Godavar Jilaru, Amala Puram, Vithapuram, Pettapuram, Samarlakota, Kakinada, Mandapeta, Ramachandrapuram, Rajamandri, Patana Pramthalo, G plus 3 Grupa Samudaya. Padamudu Jilla Loni, Pantana Stanika Sonstala Paritilo, Pedalaku, Pakailla Nirmanam, Jananeta Sankalpam, Sanchima Patamlo, Jagananta Prabutvam, Pratiaduku, Rajana Rajum Kosam. थोड़े पैसे लगाने को और दो लाख पचास हजार मोदी जी हमारे को लोन के जैसा दिए हमें पहले रेंट के घर में थे अब पैसे देने से लोन देने से हम घर खोलने को घर बना ली और अब मेरे बच्चों से मैं खुश हूँ मोदी जी साथ और मैं ये बेडरूम भरूं साथ एक बेडरूम भरूं साथ और किचन भरूं Let's make housing for all a reality. Are you ready for the challenge?
without stay and thoughts since we have been planning to make a new house before. But even though we cannot start it because we will catch up with them. It seems we are starting now because we better some safety from government side. Thank you, Sumaina ji, for uh, uh, playing a, a very relevant and apt uh, video. I hope uh, um, these are very, um, very much uh, in line with the theme of the workshop. Um, in fact, uh, the 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 light in the beneficiary's eyes, uh, owning their own home, is an inspiration for all of us, the academicians, the um, administrators, and the uh, industry experts. Uh, to achieve this housing for all uh, at at time to come thank you thank you ji so now uh, we we move upon onto the expert lecture uh, series now we have very eminent uh, um, uh, celebrated uh, faculty uh, experts with us today and then i deem it my privilege to welcome professor dr subrata chatopadhyay sir in fact i am i am indebted for my life uh, to to be um sir is my phd supervisor sir at uh, iit kharagpur um, uh, allow me to introduce sir let me um professor subrata chatopadhyay sir he is a, is a professor working as a professor and former head in the department of architecture and regional planning iit kharagpur and sir also had um, served in many capacities in at the indian institute of technology kharagpur uh, including uh, presently in, uh, dean of alumni affairs and then uh, former avinash gupta chair professor and uh, um, chairman lib central library and many more uh, uh, responsibilities sir had uh, uh, has been involved in and then sir has done his uh, phd from iit kharagpur and uh, certificate housing uh, from new castle upon tyne in united kingdom and then diploma in housing uh, from lund university sweden and uh, master of urban and regional planning from school of planning and architecture delhi 
and bachelor of architecture from uh, kolkata and uh, sir's uh, professional experience uh, spans uh, more than 32 years as of now and then uh, span including teaching research consultancy and administration and many more and then uh, sir's research areas include housing and community planning township planning energy efficient settlement planning urban heat island uh, spatio temporal study on peri urban dynamics urban brownfields and then sir has written many books and monographs and handbooks and i'll help you due to the shortage of thing i will be and then sir many uh, presented uh, various of his works at uh, various locations in international and uh, national arenas and uh, sir is uh, very um, um, working very closely with the pradhan mantri awas yojana program uh, since uh, uh, quite some time and also with the asha that is housing accelerated affordable sustainable housing accelerators and uh, in, in association with the global housing technology challenge in india and then um, uh, has uh, taken up many uh, many major consultancy and sponsored research projects and uh, sir is also the member of board of governors in school of planning and architecture delhi then sir i i take it my i, I deem it as my privilege to to welcome sir kindly over to you sir um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed for having me here. Thank you, sir. And, uh, I feel humbled at the introduction that Uma gives. And uh, I'm also very happy to be in uh, in this forum. And I think uh, the, set, the pace has been set by a very good, interesting uh, talk or debate by Sridharji, Menakshi ji and Abdul Razak ji. So they have already set the pace. I will uh, try to share my screen. Uh, just tell me if it is coming. Is the PowerPoint visible? Yes, sir. Now it is appearing, sir. Yes, sir. Now it is. So as Uma said that I have had the privilege of working closely and I'm still working with the uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. In fact, uh, I was one of the members to evaluate the GHDC. And right now we are incubating two technologies uh, in IIT Kharagpur, two emerging technologies which are not yet industry ready, but they need some incubation. But uh, today, the topic that I'm going to touch upon is uh, climate resilient housing, adopting environment friendly practices and meeting sustainable development goals. And I uh, thank my PhD scholars Kalyani and Purbita and my MCB uh, student Kasturi for compiling it for me. So since the backdrop is on the sustainable development goals, uh, I would start with, with that. This is a very famous quote that there can be no plan B as there is no planet B. And this is a quote from Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. So we've got to you know, pull up our socks because now is our time. In a, in a timeline, let me put the sustainable development goals in a timeline. We have traveled uh, across a lot of time and a lot of information and experience. We started with the post-industrial era, with the tragedy of commons. Then we, when, when we realized that the growth in economy and the decline in environment are happening side by side. So, it was kind of inversely proportional, the economic growth and environment. We had the 1972 United Conference on Human Environment, which was the first global set of principles for future international cooperation on environment. This saw a new era of global cooperation. Then we have the 1983, the Brundtland Commission came up. Our, com our common future was the buzzword Sustainable development from there emerged when people started talking about the three circles of environment, economy, and social. 
in terms of making them livable, viable, and sustainable. Next, we had the Rio conference, the Rio Art Summit in 1992, that talked about shared global concepts and a comprehensive plan of action was charted out. We move to the 2000s when we have the United UN Millennium Summit. This is the first global-based development approach that set the targets for 2015 and indicators for measuring progress. We had the Millennium Development Goals or MDGs for the period 2000 to 2015. This was followed in 2015. We had the Agenda 2030 when we had the Sustainable Development Goals. These superseded the MDGs and adopted an integrated goal based on approach towards poverty reduction, sustainable development. In parallel, we also had the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, and this was legally binding international treaty on climate change and an agreement to tackle the issue of global warming and human-induced climate change. So this is the backdrop, yes. So now we come to the sustainable development goals. And uh, as you can see on the screen, this is a word cloud taken from the Paris climate. And uh, these are some of the you know, key words that emanate. This is a famous quote by John F. Kennedy. He says, by defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it to draw hope from it and to move irresistibly towards it. So let's see what we can do in terms of the SDGs. And I will be specifically mentioning the ones that relate to our profession. So first we start with SDG 11, which is on sustainable cities and communities. And here we have a series of you know mandates like adequate, safe, and affordable housing and basic services integrated and sustainable human settlement planning, reduction of number of deaths and people affected, then integrated policies and plans towards inclusion, and support the least developed countries. These are some of the mandates under the Sustainable Development Goal 11. Here you can see on the right hand side, the share of urban population living in slums rose to 24% in 2018. And in India, about 0.8% of urban households are living in kacha houses. So in that backdrop, we come to the next SDG, SDG 9. The SDG 9 talks about industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Okay, And here, the mandates are to build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and foster innovation. Like I started off by saying that IITs and NITs are incubating some new technology. There are some ready technologies, and I will talk about the Lighthouse projects in a bit, where six new technologies are being adopted. We were just shown one from Chennai that was using precast concrete, and there are other five technologies which are being used. But there are other technologies that need hand-holding, that need incubation and development. So. This is much in line with the uh, SDG 9, which talks about uh, building resilient infrastructure. It also talks about upgrade infrastructure and retrofit industries to make them sustainable. It also talks about enhancing scientific research and support of domestic technology developed research and innovation. In fact, I'm happy to say that one of the incubators with us is talking about bamboo technology, and that is much in the line of 9b, which is talking of support, domestic technology development. So we are trying to make bamboo into a cutting edge, low cost, appropriate technology. Here on the right hand side, you can say that India has made some steady progress among 131 countries in global innovation index has risen, has risen to 48 from 57 from 2018 to 2020. Sir? Uh, yes? Uh, sorry. Yeah, yes, sir. Now it is appeared. I hope the screen is visible to all. Uh, yes. Yeah, just find out. I think the screen is visible to all. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. It can be pinned. If it's not visible, then it can be pinned. Yes, sir. Now yeah, that you can do. And uh, can I request Sorry. others to mute their microphones, please? Because there's a little bit of echo coming sometimes. Okay. So, uh, moving on, I'll next touch upon the SDG 13, which talks about climate action. And it talks about to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. This is extremely important. It talks about strengthening resilience and adaptive capacity. It talks about to improve education and awareness raising. And it also talks about promoting mechanisms for raising capacity. And I'll show you now that a lot of, you know, the vulnerability because of climate change and because of disasters can be due to anthropogenic activities. So man-made activities are also leading to some of these disasters. And the ones who are most affected are the people, are the poor people. So SDG 1 talks about no poverty. So I link it up where, 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 where it talks about no poverty so that, you know, the most vulnerable people can also be made to resist or their, their vulnerability be reduced. Here are say, some examples of anthropogenic activities that are leading to disasters, as you can see on the pictures. You can see the polluted river stream in Mumbai. You can see also in Chennai, uh, two other pictures where man-made, basically man-made activities is leading to this kind of uh, disasters. We also touch upon the SDG 12, which talks about responsible consumption and production. And here we have a long way to go. In fact, India recycles, it is reported only about 1% of its construction and demolition waste. And there we need to really make a lot of headway where, and, and I'm happy to say that the steel technology that's being pushed a bit now, and Agartala is going to take up the light gauge steel construction technology. This steel technology is completely recyclable. So, so we have to catch up. We have to really make uh, make this technology work. Here, there there is a you know comparison of sustainable development goals where we have made some headway. I mean, India's overall score across SDGs has improved six points from 60 in nine, 2019 to 66 in 2021. Yes, sorry. Now let us talk about the actual responses to, vernac uh, to climate responsiveness. First, I touch upon the vernacular approaches. And for the vernacular approaches, India, you have to consider, is a multi-climate country. So India's approach has to be different. It has zones broadly, hot, dry, warm, humid, moderate, composite, and cold. So one side fits all and one approach cannot be the solution. So for some of the approaches in hot and dry, traditionally we have seen, I'm not going into the details, but traditionally we have seen about orientation, openings, uh, the high thermal mass of the walls or internal courtyards or insulating roofs and vegetation as some of the items under hot and dry. Under hot and humid, we have also seen traditionally the ventilation or the cross ventilation, the roof the orientation, the building form and landscape, these were done for a lot of time and we have done it. What are the climate responsive modern techniques? Well, we are also doing whole building energy simulation or we are doing parametric modeling. And this is an energy simulation is a computer based analytical process that evaluates the energy performance. The energy performance tools, uh, they allow us, they, they allow us a lot of things. They uh, consider the building as a single integrated system. They can predict the thermal behavior. They can predict the impact of daylight and artificial light. They can model the impact of wind, wind pattern and ventilation. They can estimate size, capacity of equipment required for comfort. And they can calculate the effect of various building components. In fact, we are happy to say that some of our PhD research, uh, which we are we are guiding, are using you know these. Uh, modern technologies to predict the effects of greenhouse gas effect or urban heat island effects or indoor thermal comfort effects. Now, let's talk about the government housing projects. Are they climate resilient? Now, we already know that there are six lighthouse projects happening. And I already said that these are in Indore, which is using prefab 
sandwich panel. We have Rajkot, which is using monolithic concrete construction. In Lucknow, pre-made pre walls. In Chennai, precast concrete. Rachi is using 3D volumetric printing and Agatala is using light gauge steel. So, I mean, what are the advantages? Of course, these have a lot of advantages. As you can see, that most of these technologies would bring in a lot of parameters, like they would be energy efficient, they would have better thermal insulation, they would conserve natural resources, reduce carbon footprint, reduce industry byproducts, and they will produce clean construction sites as they will be mostly factory produced and they will have a dust free environment. They will also act in reduction in curing time because that leads to saving of water resources. So these are some of the advantages that we have. We have other examples also which are good. The Z homes from Bangalore is one which I wanted to touch upon. These are the zero energy development of the Z homes and some of the you know highlights of the project that they're doing. Let's see earth. They avoid using bricks because bricks often is argued takes up the topsoil, so they avoid bricks. The energy, they are sensitive to the embodied energy for the water. They are reducing the, the fresh water use and they are reducing it by about 70% by recycling of water. For the waste, solid and other ways, they are trying to recycle. For the biomass, even they are emphasizing on native plant species. So this is a very comprehensive way of approaching zero energy development or the Z homes. Z homes, I'm not coming to that. Some more details are there and, and this is quite a good example. Next, we also have a community-based microclimate resilience in Gorakhpur, Uttar Pradesh. Now, what was this? I mean, we have oftentimes seen that the, you know, the slum upgradation work does not work properly. But here we had an example where community-based microclimate resilience was adopting to climate change by designing and building new types of flood resilient and affordable houses. They were using locally available bricks with indigenous technologies and techniques that made the building brick walls less energy intensive. This is a, a, a picture from there and I've got the source out there. So these are aligned with SDG 11 to an extent. Then this was the one from Kerala, Trivandrum, and I was talking about the BSUP or the basic slum upgradation programs which fail. But here in Kerala, we have this example which involved the women community-based organization Kudumbashri. And there we find that this was a very, very successful project. So at all levels, we do have successful stories. I also have this matrix which shows some good examples of what is happening across the country. Like for instance, Siliguri has you know, converted 32,000 streetlights to LEDs, Coimbatore and Rajkot are uh, ratifying the Climate Resilient City Action Plan. Kochi is working on biodiversity, Surat is working on climate change, and Bhopal also is talking about green FAR to protect green spaces. So these are some of the very good examples that make us very proud. Now, uh, Madam, Madam Minakshi ji talked of, talked of a very important point that, okay, when we are doing a planning, we can start afresh, but what about the, you know, retrofitting? What about the building stock that already exists? And what kind of research is being done in the country? So uh, there is a lot of research going on for building retrofitting as well. And normally we talk about five phases. The five key phases of retrofitting would be phase one, pre-retrofit survey. Phase two, energy auditing and performance assessment. Phase three, identification of retrofitting options. Phase four, site implementation and commissioning, and phase five, validation and post-occupancy evaluation. I'll give you an example of one of the research which I was an examiner of, and that talks about the roofing, walling, and fenestration. And, and for the retrofitting option, that was giving a choice basket. The choice basket was entailing minimum initial cost, most energy efficient uh, method, maximum net present value and minimum life cycle cost. Let me give you one example for the roofing. It found that two coats of high albedo, white or any reflective paint can actually reduce the heat gain by about 84% and that could be the minimum initial cost option. The green roof cover of about 150 millimeters soil also reduces heat gain very, very significantly according to that study. 
a minimum life cycle cost that is a very easy option of having a 6 mm crazy ceramic tiles on a 12 mm mortar that also reduce the heat gain by 68 to 70% which is significant coming to the wall we found that the study talks about the minimum initial cost is a green cover or creepers that can reduce very significantly the most energy efficient would however be a white or a silver aluminum composite panel with puff core or a 12 millimeter gypsum board that can reduce heat very very significantly and for the minimum life cycle cost the study found that 12 millimeter insulating board on existing walls also can reduce more than 43 percent reduction in heat gain for the fenestration uh, the three examples one we can do is applying a layer of black tinted solar film that also reduces the heat gain to some extent a double glazing of course with colored tinted float glass would would reduce it much further and a six millimeter tinted float glass of approved color with reflective soft coating also does a reflect a reduction in heat gain so these are some very simple techniques of retrofitting you know buildings that are already there and we do need to see that these buildings actually consume a lot of you know energy and we need to you know uh, reduce that in fact uh, some of these buildings we find that are consuming energy to the extent of 160 to 200 kilowatt hour per meter square per year which is extremely high uh, some of the okay so i will now come quickly to my conclusion and in the conclusion, I'll talk about two points. One is we have to understand that we live in a world of connected systems. Okay, Each system is curiously connected to each other. And there is no or nothing as an externality. And I'm referring to a research, to a, to a text on a book called Happy City. And, and that's, that's a very interesting book. I mean, you can take a read of this book and it talks about these concepts. And there it talks, it argues about housing and transportation. And here they're comparing, you know, settlements. So it's not just the dwelling unit or the cluster level. It's also the settlement that has to come, that has to be planned properly. So it's talking about settlements where we have the typical American downtown development versus peri-urban or uh, suburban development. So here it says a neighborhood on a small lot and duple can be serviced at one fourth the cost of otherwise typical American large lot detached homes, which was once a fad, but now people are realizing that these are extremely untenable. Again, another study here says in 2005, 2006, about 25 million ch school children had to be bust because they were staying far away. And that costed around 19 billion US dollars at the rate of 750 US dollars per student. And that money could, could go directly for the education of the children. According to Housing and Transportation Mobility Index, carbon dioxide emission per household for auto use has a range from 5.4 tons per year to 13.5 tons per year, depending on where you are located. You are, you are in the downtown so that your travel time and destination to tra travel time is reduced to whether you are in a peri-urban suburban area and housing and transportation cost also come as a as a percentage of median income ranges from less than 40 percent to more than 60 percent depending on where you are situated also comparison on return per acre shows that a downtown real estate is seven times that of peripheral real estate uh, return per acre so these are some of the points that make us think that make us think in a totality in totality what should be the shape and size of our future settlements coming to the income and livelihood here we find a job density of about 74 jobs per acre this was a study which says that a small downtown business was giving 74 jobs per acre as opposed to a six job per acre in a suburban typical Walmart kind of thing. So are we going to do such things in future for our planning? The Asheville uh, changed zoning policy for, for the equation land to distance to scale to cash flow. What they did was they started using flexible use of downtown buildings. They created livelier streets 
they introduced uh, public events and they introduced the concept of user should pay for the garage concept. So these were some of the things that were done in Asheville and, and they thought that, you know, this was working very well. So in conclusion, I would say that nodes of job density, residential density, tax density, all lead to nodes of energy efficiency. So when we are talking in the backdrop of sustainable development goals, when we are talking in terms of reducing the carbon footprint, we have to really involve all this. We have to be, you know, uh, talking about the dwelling unit level, the cluster level, and also the neighborhood level. There uh, is my reference, list of reference, and a very good thank you for a very good listening. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, such an energetic and uh, very uh, enlightening um, lecture and then uh, in fact uh, we are we are deeply indebted sir for accepting the invitation in very short notice and then uh, uh, coming up with uh, such uh, 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 very thought provoking uh, 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 deliberations and then sir uh, your presentation especially the, the points touched upon like uh, no plan b as there is no planet b and uh, 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 the climate uh, change climatic change is basically uh, man made because of the man made activities and uh, responsible production and consumption especially the demolition waste and uh, light gauze steel construction technology and uh, vernacular approaches and uh, one design does not fit all especially when we are having a, a very uh, uh, a very uh, what a very large uh, pradhan mantri avas yojana kind of very mass housing then uh, definitely there is a need for uh, adopting or uh, there is definitely a customization of design to suit to various climatic conditions that is a very necessary uh, input sir for all the administrators so that uh, multiplication normally may not really yield uh, benefits in a long term uh, considering the energy uh, consumption requirements and also sir the kind of modern uh, techniques that uh, you have brought in like uh, the uh, use of energy simulations in uh, identifying the life cycle costing and basically the uh, impact of our housing on the energy and then thus uh, the impact on the sustainability that is really uh, that would uh, uh, make people think sir um, and then uh, and uh, the question like are government projects really climate resistant yes of course although a very large uh, extensive uh, efforts are being done then uh, when the uh, when the industry uh, as well as the academia if their input especially to suit the uh, climatic and customization of the designs i think uh, the overall goal can be far more uh, reaching sir definitely and then um, and then uh, this uh, the especially uh, at towards the end so the job density and residential density and the tax density so Basically, when we are connecting the sustainability goals to uh, all economy, because ultimately the sustainability should be paying or should be affordable as well. That is a uh, point very well driven, well sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, uh, deliberations and uh, making uh, your, your uh, truly um, very valuable uh, contribution to this uh, workshop, sir. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Uma, and with your permission and with the permission of the chair, I will now go back to my class because I have a class going on. But in case there is anything you want, I will come back, you call me over yes, phone. Yes, okay? yes, yes, if I am allowed, I will just go and join my class. Yes, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Namaskar, thank you. Sir. Namaskar, sir. Yes. But do call me when Monto speaks because I want to hear Monto. <laughs> yes, sir. Surely, sir. Surely, okay, sir. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, and then now uh, I, I take uh, this privilege to uh, welcome Dr. Sashibhushan, sir. Um, sir is, um, um, is there, basically is a lighthouse of um, uh, what, uh, what not um, technology, that means basically uh, the architectural um, aspects as well as the technology aspects since, uh, since um, quite a thing, so kindly allow me to introduce sir uh, with a few of this thing. So Dr. B. Sashibhushan sir did his uh, BR from Kerala University and uh, Master of Town Planning uh, uh, 
from Madras University and PhD from Mysore University. And he taught and researched at the uh, School of Planning and Architecture, Chennai, and Institute of Development Studies at University of Mysore. And uh, Dr. Bhushan sir served as a consultant to the United Nations at Nagoya and was associated with Human Settlement Studies of International Institute of Environment and Development, London, on several policy issues in India and other Asian countries. And then uh, since uh, 1987, Dr. Bhushan sir is practicing architecture in Mysore and Bangalore and sir is recipient of numerous, numerous awards and uh, um, especially in the field, not only in architecture, but also um, across uh, uh, basically the technology and uh, uh, many of the developments uh, that are happening in, uh, uh, in terms of um, cost efficiency, in terms of advancements in the construction industry itself as such. Also, Dr. Bhushan sir had been associated with several educational institutes as uh, board of studies and on sir is on doctoral committees. There is also a visiting professor and professor of eminence at many architectural colleges in Mysore, Bangalore, Manipal. And uh, sir has written a uh, number of books uh, and uh, many technical reports for the United Nations and also um, for various um, in national and international journals. And, um, and uh, sir's uh, philosophy and works are made part of the syllabus of contemporary architecture uh, in many of the schools of architecture in our country uh, uh, as part of the uh, syllabus. So uh, we are highly indebted, sir, to, to having accepting our invitation. And then uh, kindly, um, we, we are longing to listen to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, am I audible? I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir, sir. You are. Yes, sir. Um, okay. Uh, I I can upload this now. Okay. My 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 screen can be shared. Upload it. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah. Okay. How do you make this? Uh, I'm not very familiar with this uh, Google Doc. Uh, so there is one icon uh, with an arrow symbol. You need to click that and then share. There will be three options. Uh, present your entire screen, a window, and a tab. Okay. Yeah, that, that is what the, I was trying to do. That, yeah, you can click on present your entire screen. Not entire the screen or a video or a tab. Uh, so uh, first, any of the first two options you can uh, select. Yes. So before that, you have to open the slides, PPTs first. Yes. Yeah, OK. I have, I have opened that. Okay, so uh, have you clicked on uh, present your entire screen? No, I have uh, present the window. Yes. Okay, uh, then you'll have to select one window, sir. If you click there, there uh, like many windows will appear. So you'll have to select one window which you want to share. And after clicking on the window, you can uh, click on share, share button. So it's not clicking for some reason. Share as an application window, okay. Yes, it's, uh, it's loading, sir. Yeah, it's visible. Is it there? Uh, you said your presentation is not visible. Your Chrome, uh, your uh, this uh, Chrome window is visible. Okay. 
how to make it happen sir i think it will be better to select the uh, share your entire screen mode okay us okay and their screen right yeah and there also you'll have to select the screen and then share is it sharing uh yes sir yeah 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 now uh, you can go to the presentation yeah it's visible sir yes. is it visible yes sir yes yes sir yes sir. okay <clears throat> yeah okay thank you uma shankar and yes, also thank you school of planning and uh, architecture vijayawada for inviting me <clears throat> uh and making a very um, very kind and uh, uh, extensive uh, introduction which i don't deserve um and uh, I, i was it was so nice listening to the previous speakers i came to know about many things which i was not knowing and i would like to present only a very small aspect of my work uh which covers a Three or four, four decades of work, which also includes some of my researches in the early part, and even now some of the technological researches we keep on doing privately. Okay, but I will not cover all that because we have very short time. This twenty minutes is too short a time <coughs> to present anything. I would like to present our view of. housing our view of habitat and the technological inputs of habitat how that could be part of the social development and it is not innovation of technology per se is important uh i believe that assimilation of the technology within the society within the context in which we work is more important unless that doesn't happen technology will not be absorbed into the society it will not be appropriate to the society and it will not function well as well okay this is actually the experience of mine with many of the works we uh, <coughs> happen to do in the early part of my practice and, and also as consultant to many of the government projects which has made me think like this and even work more on that aspect i to me looking at housing for the last uh, so many decades housing is understood as a very drab word and in fact it is almost sounding because of the it sounds more banal like dwelling units see dwelling units when you say it is something like a, a, a an item as some physical thing that may, that doesn't give you the complete idea about a house or nothing about a home so but this is a technical way in which we have been looking at uh shelter provision for long time maybe post independence time the emphasis has been on production of these building units the numbers the numbers is that we are more worried about and when you work only on that numbers we are I, I, this is true of whether we have a thought of squatter re rehabilitation urban housing or rural housing anything and mass housing came to be considered as within a re, as a real estate model within the public sector 
to be built by private contractors through public agencies. In all that used to happen, and even now it is happening, with an area or with, a, with an environment of total suspicion. Everybody suspect, suspects everybody else. And in that, we use certain standardized technologies, manuals, norms, and even design. That has been the pattern. The innovation is almost non-existent. And there is a, a dramatic change, perhaps, in some places that has been thwarted or attempted to be thwarted uh, very severely as well. So naturally, many of us were uh, uh, sort of, um, <coughs> uh, as, as young architects and young consultants, when he started working with some of these projects, say 20, 25 years ago, we thought a lot could be achieved. And there were many politicians, many administrative officers who were also thinking similarly, but many of us got disappointed. But thanks to that experience, uh, when I see some things happening, which is different now, I feel happy about it. So maybe a lot more could be done. So I look at housing not as individual dwelling units, as uh, Professor, uh, uh, the, the previous speaker also has spoken similarly, I, I look at it as part of a, a, a habitat, human habitat, that is essential for human, humanity to survive, not as individuals, but as a, as a community. Now, in this presentation, I make three basic assumptions or basic premises that one is Habitat is an inclusive concept, and that is for all living things and their interdependence. And human habitat is not only that interdependence, but also the layer of culture within the human society and its productive economic and political structure as well. Number two, the inclusive human habitat is to manage the habitat of all sections of the society not just part. Creating an affordable habitat means improving habitat networks, villages, towns, cities with strategy to cover the entire spectrum of uh, including the metropolitan hubs. <clears throat> not just creating selective smart cities like we have been doing is is really demonstrative effect and may have some some sloganeering effect Otherwise, it, it may not have much, much to uh, contribute to the quality of the environment as a whole. Basic. Sorry to interrupt, sir. The slides are not pro proceeding, sir. Malab, uh, is it? Light? Is not the, light? The, the, we are still on the first slide, sir. Okay. okay. It, uh, not, uh, I am not moving, actually. Okay. I am also, um, see that the slide, now the slide is moving, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, okay. It is, I, I, I have to move it manually. Okay. The third premise is that the technology changes and images on everything. Its management and organizations is not just to make production of units alone. Okay, and it all happens in a context. Technology doesn't happen without a context, and the context is very important as climate responsive housing is also context responsive. So, in that, basically, I look at it not as the introduction of very modern or up to date scientific technologies, but what kind of technologies could be appropriate to a place. So, in that skill, the skill of labor, labor and skill set available, the industry structure locally available and its organization, and thirdly, the local resources. This, these three things make a very important aspect, very important factor in deciding what kind of technology is appropriate to your place. 
I would also like to argue that management and organization of building industry and the technology introduction, it makes a lot of difference. So you can introduce the technology top down. That has been happening most often. You, you bring it from somewhere and bring it down to big cities, then smaller cities, then towns and villages later. And naturally, it actually happens at the disadvantageous uh, situation of the lower uh, settlements, lower tier of cities or settlements. So that also doesn't work. Or the vernacular idea of starting from bottom up also doesn't often work. We may require an innovation somewhere from the middle in not, not necessarily high-end technology, not necessarily a low-end technology, but somewhere uh, via media has to be found out and different channels of innovation has to happen in that way. And also, it is not just technology transfer, but technology innovation, which means adaptation of technology to a suitable uh, modification at the local situation is an adaptive innovation that is innovation itself and creating hybridity in the organization and encouraging middle level players and improving skills and capability of it of intermediate towns and cities and rural labor often migrate periodically to smaller towns and also even intermediate towns and even bigger towns for work in construction sector and most people who are thrown out of the village, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the crowding in the agricultural segment, they are largely unskilled to be effectively absorbed in large cities. So they come out as labor and perhaps they are more easily absorbed in the construction sector. But if the, that, that could change very badly, unless they are trained. So these smaller settlements, construction in smaller segments of con you know, uh, uh, firms could be a training ground as well for these kind of things. So I will now introduce three, a, a few of my projects, which uh, to my understanding was a failure. Uh, but it was, we have learned a lot from that failure. The first one is, uh, a, this is what I'm showing is a low cost housing scheme, which was done in 1988. The design was based on a traditional agraharas. However, the units I mean, there are in the community space in the middle and the various division, uh, you know, design and co uh, combinations and configurations have worked out various types of units. And, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there are a lot of uh, inputs that has gone into the design of these and in also in adopting certain types of technologies to make it cheaper or cost effective. Cost effectiveness in, in, in the sustainability was an unheard thing at that time in the 1988. It, it was just being talked about. But this was a, a, a very important factor at that time was the cost effectiveness or low cost uh, housing. Now, <clears throat> this particular concept of community living was not very enthusiastically ad ad adapted by the people who, who were allotted these houses. They, in fact, were looking, most of them, everyone was looking forward to an individual compounded house, however small that compound be. Isolation from community, pursuing individual dreams of modern living, that, that militated against this concept. Over the years, the place has become like any other low-income house, housing schemes. Common spaces were misused. The house has not become a home. It has become a property. So that is, that is perhaps the fundamental idea about housing today is that it is not just a, a bought 
are adapted as a house but as a property so it is a property that has to be passed down to next generation or could be sold at a higher price at a lower uh, i mean uh, at a different time now the income based classification of people and adopting the housing pattern for those income groups was the highlight of these schemes the hardcore sponsored schemes especially and here we used several technologies at that time one is that of uh, mud blocks stabilized mud blocks using a 5% stabilization for walls brick walls for making roofs cheaper and also a, a methodology of using uh, making brick walls without a centering but a mob or a mobile centering um optimized design for common walls and between units the precast concrete opening frames and and many such things were done but especially that the roofing technology which is because it was a very um very costly item in a house the most costly item is the the as, as an individual item is the roof so we wanted to reduce the cost of that that is why we try to do this but the, this technology was somehow not acceptable for the um, the contractors so they thwarted it they started the work came up to the roof and said we can't do it you don't know how to do it we built 12 units as a demonstration units we made them sit through and work out the they we trained the masons and showed them how it could be done but in spite of that the system resisted and it was nothing was done it was completely changed to normal concrete roof later well that is also uh, even the people also did not want it the vaulting system which we have done <coughs> were uh, not accepted by public beneficiaries it was demolished many of those roofs were demolished within 2 years and it was replaced by concrete roof because they found that building something over that is much more easier and useful as an income generation the problem with shaw this houses this housing is that we never consult we never consulted at that time at least the actual beneficiaries and what is their idea of house whether house itself is a priority or not for many of the low income or economically weaker second house is not the priority a regular income is the priority and they cannot even pay that emi that is calculated and therefore they try to rent it out and live somewhere else so this is this is known to everyone now so but we have not improved uh, the government system most often work the similar fashion and only thing is that we have brought much more fancier technologies but uh, uh, the people feel that they are they are put in pigeon holes in more often than not and a habitat development definitely doesn't take place a community doesn't happen at all but this technology which we somehow develop develop means we develop the skill the technology was known for centuries for several centuries maybe a millennium it developed places and even in india there were many places it was being used earlier as well. so here we got familiar with this technology and it was a novel thing for middle class and upper middle class well so i got several people who adapted to this novelty and novelty was is always in architecture novelty is the, the basic thing which a technology has got pushed and this is exactly what, what the technology which was introduced by lorry baker in kerala all over kerala quite successfully it was largely for middle class and upper middle class people not for people who really wanted low cost house 
So it is the it is the novelty of the construction, novelty of the spaces they to create. It is the vanity attached to uh, the the novelty. All this has created the spontaneous acceptance of certain things, but it is pushed to a a group of people who are looking for some other thing. It will not work. So this is the take home of this experiment which we had. Uh, so I, I can't say that it was totally useless. It had some some good things happening as well. In that sense, uh, this is uh, similarly building domes. We have been doing this. We have done it for houses. We have done it for several other situations also, without centering. It it works out cheaper. It works out uh, very interesting, and also it. Both the walls and domes have comparatively lesser radiation coming from outside, and because much part of the entire roof, at least half of the entire roof, will be on shade always. So this is inside of that. We also tried this an experiment of working out or, or, or the organization of. Building construction, because building construction even today is, as I said it earlier, is a contractor-based model with suspicion. And even in private sector, this this goes on, but we have not. And in that, what is happening is everybody complains about labor, the labor quality, the labor's. Um, uh, skills, all that we complain about, but we also complain about they ask too much of wage. So as much as possible, we want to make labor dispensive. How we can dispense with labor is the major uh, question that we all, almost all developers, all contractors try to do. Right. So this is something which which we think, which I think we have to work on. How, one way of it is to to go for automations, go for uh, um, any kind of technology which dispenses with that kind of thing. More of machines, more of robots, more of arti artificial intelligence, all that could come. And even 3D printing, all that is possible, but is that the only solution? So we were trying with a different method of work. This was actually not a housing scheme, but a, a, a resort where we try to do it with contractors. It's quite early done. Uh, it's, it's about 20 years ago. Experiment to work with way people used to build and design the on site and without intermediary of a contractor. And not much of drawings, not much of uh, um, um, you know, a contractor to interpret drawings or a, a, a contracting system, but using low energy, low labor intensive methods, avoiding organized contracting system, stabilized mud blocks, direct appeal to the middle class appeal of visual sensibilities, all that were added here. But at the same time, we could successfully create this and what you found in the end was the people who were building it, the carpenters who were constructing it, and the people uh, like the uh, the masons who were working on this, and also fabricators who were doing some for space frames there. All that, all those people enjoyed the whole thing, and it was a very very creative process, and we also did enjoy that. Apart from that, we 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 could not do it. It was not very easily replicable model, but still we are doing it. We are trying to make a way in between. Now I want to introduce a little idea about income elast elasticity of housing demand, which explains why uh, the real estate is concentrating in big cities. See, the income elasticity is a concept in which how much you spend on an item of for your essentials of your total income of a household. 
okay certain items like necessities it always it goes on increasing the percentage we spend on those necessities goes on increasing proportionately but not be in the same proportion certain items we spent more when the income grows up that they are, we call that luxuries and there are certain items like clothes for example it may for some people it will be necessity or less than necessity you, you your income goes up you may not spend that much but when you are in the middle income you will spend some and food for example it it won't go up ext- uh, if your income goes beyond certain level so that elasticity is there is a deficit but in case of housing certain people the poorer sections of the people or the ewas or lig as the government calls them they have very low priority because they cannot afford even an em so such people it it it, it is not at all a question of um, having an, an interest in buying a home they are somehow managing to build one or managing to create one like in a in a, a squatter settlement or with the help of others or uh, find uh, a portion of a house and things like that they are creating solutions them, themselves but that is not the case with luxury housing where luxury housing as the income goes up demands are more elastic and more of luxury more elastic the demand for houses house becomes a commodity to buy and sell and just to invest as well and that is why perhaps that underlines real estates love for larger cities because you'll find large number of people of that kind compared to smaller cities now the problem with how housing or the habitat has been several fold and one of the is that big cities have their own problem and smaller cities have their own unfortunately all big cities is uh, in the glo- global cities or uh, na- na- national cities they are not only really look global in appearance more and more but also in substance the dominance of capitalizing building industry for example the structured process as we have already mentioned the promoting limited material palette the current fashion of current fashion as well as the branding of certain formal and visual qualities all they lead to the situation where large city scene is becoming anonymous places architecturally socially problematic and functionally and infrastructurally as well as ecologically so this is what happens in big cities uh, a completely lost the idea of local fit we we find bangalore or delhi or chennai and many places are looking similar a similar climate is not at all a concern and in the ends of creating this nightmarish habitats whether in hong kong or in mysore your left side is a hong kong small a uh, low income settlement and uh, low income housing apartments multi storied 25 stories and they are like pigeon holes and it it is a terrible place to live in it, it looks very neat from maybe from outside compared to our slums but in reality they they are more or more or less the same in terms of quality or you see the other side they are low cost housing which was done 30 years ago ews houses ews lig houses which had only gro- ground floor to begin with and over the years they have built one above the other because it gives them additional income and finally they also become pigeon holes they also become more or less same nightmarish habitats as the other one to begin with they were sponsored housing schemes on the other end you have the technologies which is happening elsewhere which is highly innovative real uh, using real time configurators the future of real estate development uh, this is promoted by sahadeep architects in london based 
firm, a technology-enabled online neighborhood formation, and its subsequent hosting in resource-effective, sustainable, these are all words, I am not sure whether they are, physical realization that utilizes advances in digital manufacturing and very long and robust evolution. This is their words. Whatever it is, what they are trying to do is a luxury housing in an island country of Honduras. And it is, the, the major attraction is that technologically it is a, it's a very interesting proposition. Each of the apartment could be designed by the buyer. Okay, it can be, they have a, uh, a software in which they can interact and move around things here and there, the rooms can be changed and, and it, it, it can be modeled for your own occupation. So it's, a, it's a very innovative that way. But it's promoted by three cons consortium or two or three people who are uh, big players in North America and also in Europe. And uh, that, that, that is the kind of thing happens. It is the uh, the the what do you say cutting edge technology which makes appeal to um, to uh, the best habitat or whatever you call it but how many can afford it is a big question how many countries how many uh, places in India or in other countries can afford it that's a bigger question most and even in coming into India and the most small towns or rural town areas as well as second level cities, they are beautiful in as communities even now, but they may not be very uh, economically successful. They will they will be stagnating economically, and what happened to the uh, to these places? Uh, whether they, you have multi-story buildings coming up, drab. Uh, constructions are coming up, the new housing estates are also coming up in some places. And I have noticed many of the uh, villages around, uh, I find new constructions that is coming up is just trying to imitate the way the multi-storied buildings or individual buildings in, uh, in the, the urban areas nearby is building. So it is just the copy and and paste it. That is kind of thing of organization that is happening. It is not necessarily comfortable, not necessarily functional. It is more of the look, more of color, more of that kind of visual appeal that matters. And small towns are stagnating. We had for at least two decades, Government of India and also many other places, we academically also, we have been talking about multi-level planning and an urbanization focusing on lower levels at role, the role of, in fact, we did a housing, uh, a, a, a participated in a multi-continental uh, research project under the IAED London, uh, looking at the role of small and intermediate towns in development itself and also how multi-level planning and regional planning can help development, also habitat development. But what happened to all that, we do not know. And we can just think of big cities we talked about, but still there were people who were talking about the economies of big cities and especially downtowns. But there are many people who talk about going back to villages, but how many of them go, that we do not know. And we know that there are many, many people who talk about going back to villages, but they are also sucked up in the big cities and they are not even able to move to smaller cities. So this is a situation in which I was looking at a technology model. This is not very new. There are many people have worked similar models. John, John Turner has worked this kind of models in, 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 in his book. I think he has introduced it in 1970 or 80. This is, I am picking up from that uh, and trying to 
put my own thing into this, adding some more dimensions. John Turner has been looking at it uh, in a book uh, he wrote, The Freedom to Build. The Freedom to Build was actually a, a revolutionary book in which he was trying, was sitting, uh, trying to uh, um, romanticize on the freedom of the uh, scatter settlers to build against the people who can afford to build bigger things, but not they don't have the freedom to do it. Okay. Anyway, it, it is a different approach altogether. But here, if you look at this, we have low tech or traditional or the, the vernacular, as you call it, at one end, lower end, and the technology goes up. You have middle appropriate and then high tech, labor, dispensive, and then frontier high skill scientific segments. It is going up on one side. And the other side is uh, the professional involvement. You have more and more professional involvement as you go up in tire. And from left to right, you have intense labor and the other side is central capital intensive thing happening. So these are, this is the, the matrix. In that matrix, you can find a hut or a bullock cart you'll find in the lower. It is this the technology appeals to everything, including transportation or, or any 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 item of production. So you have a hut, a shack, and an individual house could happen in the lower quarter, and it can move urban housing or middle housing and apartments and all that will come to diagonally. It moves up, and a car comes somewhere in the middle, and similarly mansions and luxury apartments comes there. Then bullet train or spacecraft come to the extreme where the whole difference is that when it comes to bullet train and space with a high technology, highly intensive labor of a different kind. Okay. And it is a capital intensive as well. They are frontiers. Those frontiers are not for everybody and not for everyday life. Okay. But there are fallouts like 3D printing, for example. 3D printing is something which is uh, coming up quite fast and people are using it. And I, I see some models which are being talked about. The models in which 3D printing is happening in IIT, you know, they showed it in IIT Chennai and some other places also, which looks not something very appealing at all. First and foremost thing, the 3D printing is a fantastic thing as a technology. But it is something which you require a printer which is larger than the product. And you create, so that makes it a limitation for you to, to, to apply it with a large thing like as a building or as a multi-story building. And you keep on building it, you can do it fast maybe, but it is something which you, you can't keep on do, creating a, a printer which is as big as uh, the building itself. So we need a different kind of 3D printing. So that is why, again, I am, uh, I, I get, um, I, in fact, my own son who is doing research on this in ETH and, uh, and also works with Saha Hadid. So he is talking about, they had actually prototyped and built a bridge in um, in Binale, Venice Binale, last year, uh, a bridge which is a footbridge, and that is 3D printed, but not the whole thing is built, not built on site, but it was printed as compartments or as different components, and then they were assembled as compressive R structures. So it is a it is a 3D printing but it is a compressive st structure which was made and it was assembled on site maybe this this is something it 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 holds good uh, holds promise for the future but anyway when you look at smaller towns also look at intermediate level towns where the future of urbanization in india is perhaps then we may not be able to bring these technologies directly. Even the things which we are talking about, like shear walls, can be brought without you know, some kind of problems happening in between.
So with this, uh, we require appropriation of the contest and that contest, we think that we have to go down to be smaller towns. Then we look at a construction techniques and technology, more importantly, the management of it, making it production as well as fabrication process as a base of architectural project production, base of architecture itself, architecture of the future as, as, as an architectural habitat. We are changing the way we build, the way the building industry is. So I will give one example more, which we are currently at building. It is not housing project, but a school, which is also a part of a habitat. So it is something, a school is also like house, it's a part of everyday life. Not like this, uh, we're building in this place called Bijapur. You may, you may be Vijayapura, it is called. Oh, I think I'll have to close up, okay. Uh, where we are trying to um, avoid contractors and building it, a new development is taking place. Some developments of innovations are taking place, like precast vaulting, partially precast walls, which is assembled on the site with all the blocks, and then a scraped concrete is put over that. Or avoiding windows, or putting a screen wall apart from the building, it is set apart, and a green patch in between the classrooms and the outer screen. And these were all used by involving the local labor, local labor teams, and creating a, 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 a collaborative, in, innovative, or collaborative, interactive uh, project. And here, the design is keeping with the technology and method of execution, and the process weighed high in design of the campus. And it evolved everything that was not worked out before what the work started. Though the general master plan was made and construction proceeded piecemeal and requirements to evolve along with that. So it is using labor. We kept on changing the design and that was accommodated and the, the work proce proceeded. So it was not that so fast a construction. It was slow construction, but it the school kept on growing and we kept on building. So this is this is the intermediate spaces in between. Most of these are uh, pieces which are assembled at site. They are concrete uh, uh, encased in, in hollow clay blocks. Uh, they work as intermediate supports. And the classrooms don't have some of the classrooms don't have, uh, depending upon the orientation, they don't have windows. They open to an outer court and the court has a, a screen wall. And these are the screen walls where we give a framework, concrete framework, and then local shaba stones are cut and given with a one particular design, then the mason decide how to put it, whichever way they want to put it. And in the end, they also enjoy doing it. And finally, we get a very, very interesting surface. And the roof is partially precast, precast uh, without centering. A dome for a multi-purpose hall and, and a dining was built. It is 60 feet wall. Uh, uh, span dome and it is also partially precast as a way of building using uh, hollow clay blocks and then with a screen on top so it reduces le the heat transfer to inside and the whole of this finally we get into one kind of an arrangement we, we have tried to put together into a theory a theory by which uh, the architecture or, or the habitat is habitat architecture is not something just happens in metropolitan cities or intermediate cities or small towns. It happens throughout the whole spectrum and with different kinds of professional involvement. 
The involvement includes the habitat community, the whole community involved uh, driven collective design like it happened in villages earlier. And even now it happens in vernacular or uh, uh, the informal uh, uh, building sectors and upgraded vernacular through NGOs till it could happen, happen the evolving type. And then you have a segment which is hybrid where quasi-professional architecture happens. Quasi, a component making can happen, promoting cooperative ventures, architects, engineers, technicians, fabricators, and small builders. And that is the, it happens in small towns. Or we can have individualistic, complex concentration technology frontier ones in cities. That is highly disruptive, game, change, game changers, product oriented, partly part of the global economy and networking the complex and mostly usually dominant. The whole interesting thing about this is this system. So you really you don't have one particular model to be adopted everywhere. The whole practices, architectural practices or building practices or the the whole of um, habitat technology organization or real estate, all this is not just one model. There are plurality of models and you let all of them uh, survive and let that be a model in which the people who are migrating to cities have different places that they can get trained and move upwards and this is this is this should be part of a larger uh, policy and that is when the the, the 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 government itself has got the urban housing or urban development and poverty alleviation they know pretty well that poverty alleviation has to be part of the organization itself. So then the housing technology can become one of the major users of that poverty alleviation itself, a training ground for technology. This is part of the school. And finally, I will come to the conclusion. Uh, that can we rethink our habitat and architecture? Can we start with every day and from the middle, if not bottoms up in developing countries and, and places in India? Habitat had been created by natural evolution and uh, cultural practices. Only set, the settlements produced in network economy and only that part which the influential elites participate because the technical, political, and administrative systems created under the economic system, this is permanent, the, the, the dominant economic system is increasingly highly networked and is terribly complex today. It is also cruelly political. It may require enormous rethinking to tame that complexity, its production and manufacturing processes profiteering, the business, and the management, etc. No technology alone can create a human habitat. If we want to achieve the goodness of earlier simple architecture or simple, we, we marvel at the smaller towns, marvel at the villages or at the rural areas. But we may need to leave, if we want that life back, we have we must be ready to restructure our lives, our economic and social life. Then we can start thinking that way. Otherwise, we can only marvel at them because they are isolated vernacular ones and they are slowly vanishing. So we have to do something else. In any case, the habitat production will be that of a coexistence of a plethora of models. That's what I already said. So that is the only way perhaps the future is sustainable. And that is in the meantime, if you are working in smaller towns, intermediate cities and working with people, architecture is no more uh, uh, need be your studio base. It could happen and it could be a verb, really a verb, not a product. And it will be Actually, actually, a delight in doing. 
and participating, not of buying or being in beauty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bhushan, sir, uh, for this insightful and uh, um, very uh, inspiring uh, uh, lecture. Um, like uh, uh, from the from the School of Architecture side, uh, we are very much thankful, sir. Uh, now, now, actually, I'm afraid uh, if uh, Professor Doc, um, Professor Dr. Montomoni, sir, uh, whether sir is still available uh, because sir are having another meeting. Uh, uh, may may I request Mo Monto sir if you are there to take on please. I think already sir is not there. I think. I think so. Uh, I think we. Hello, uh, sir. So then uh, we proceed uh, to the concluding remarks. Uh, I request uh, uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Rajat sir to uh, to present the concluding remarks, please. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahabasinder Basinderji. So actually, we got a call from uh, my two professor. I uh, got some other extension program. We are a little bit of uh, out of our time because uh, we already crossed half an hour more. So we had to attend another meeting and uh, in the university. So we apologize for that, and then maybe we will have a chance to listen to him later. Okay, if I come to the uh, end part of this today's uh, webinar, I would like to highlight. We all are discussing about uh, housing uh, as an industry, as a market, and it has an externality, and also uh, there's a political field, governance. So it is a very complex uh, you know, subject. What what we discuss in two two and a half hours is only to take away certain aspects related to housing, which is everybody is aware of the fact that it is, yeah area of uh, integrating various things into our planning, research and development, technology, innovation. But what I am uh, observing from uh, different, uh, uh, you know, literature as well as practice by different governments from the national to the state. So technology innovation is one of the theme of the national uh, campaign what we discussed earlier about uh, inclusive housing. But I, I would like to state that something what is more important for a planner or a developer or a policy maker or even for a learner who is a student of architecture or planning. So there are two sides of the same coin when we are looking at housing. So I look at, uh, first of all, uh, technology innovation, when we think of uh, housing, it should provide all the occupants with three things. Sufficient space for household activities inside and outside the four walls, whatever the rooms we create for them, for their living. They should be access to thermal comfort within the building, I mean, inside the house, and natural ventilation from fresh air and breathe. And thirdly, every household living in a house need to be protected from air and noise pollution. So I would like to bring two things into your minds of the, the young generation of uh, learners who are the planners and uh, designers. So we look at a uh, house is a building. Where are we talking about uh, how we can go for uh, innovations and technology to make uh, a building usable for uh, people. Simple dwelling, which is maybe a small hut or uh, a complex structure. What today we're talking about, uh, you know, all uh, vertical gardening and, uh, um, you know, e-neighborhoods and so many things. It is composed of many uh, aspects. But from the outset, one has to see uh, it is a social unit who is going to live in the house. Building is not meant for only building to see from outside. 
but it is a social unit where the people live a household maybe we know that people are living in rural areas a joint family system is not one person is many people live in the house and we move to the cities where even single person also become part of the house so it is a individual or a group so we have to think in mind the second point which always i tell my students look at building as a house it's not complete but you have to look at house as a home h o m e it is generally a place that is close to the heart of the owner or the renter and can become a prized possession it is an investment so even for a rented house you have to pay some rent as well as advance it is an investment so it is a household uh, who are um, living in the house where you have to see it, how you make uh, it's uh, more of psychological a strongest sense of home is commonly coincides geographically with their dwelling and social networks because everyone interacts in the house and the neighbors and the neighborhood we all heard about that popularly we talk about something about home a man's home is his castle there is no place like home be a part of home make yourself at home how a uh, home is where your uh, heart is so it is something which is very socially innovative or socially understandable so the inhabitants should feel that the technology and innovation should facilitate a positive sense of nature and culturally sustainable way of life the technology and innovation should support the inhabitants at household level and also in neighborhood units where their family is living together towards achieve energy efficiency conservation of water reduce the and reuse of both solid and liquid waste and thirdly it create housing household living is a unique experience to enhance their mental and physical health today we talk about innovation but i think what is more important to understand from housing perspective is social innovation well innovation refers to capacity to create and implement novel ideas that are proven to deliver value the social refers to the kind of value that innovation is expected to de deliver a value that is less concerned with profit and more with aspects like quality of life solidarity and well-being so social innovation entails a paradigm shift and promote real empowerment of people furthermore it helps residents improve their quality of life and make their sense of community stronger to end my conclusion i would like to say all of you are familiar today we are talking about in the pandemic situation where we are focusing on our urban planning and design towards walkability and recycling and then street making and everything you know so what is people talk about today complete street that means place making but i am trying to say that other hand we have to make a complete house that is home making which is important to this context where you are creating a livable environment for the people to live so within this uh, short uh, small note i would like to take this opportunity to thank all the participants um, to be patient enough to even exceed the time and the speakers and the organizers and over to the coordinator thank you all thank you thank you sir thank you uh, professor dr abdul rajak sir for uh, summarizing the valuable points delivered by our uh, guests and expert speakers um, now uh, i would like to invite uh, ms somaina islari ji assistant professor of architecture uh, to propose the vote of thanks please thank you sir uh, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose the vote of thanks uh, for this workshop i on behalf of the organizing team extend a very hearty gratitude to each and every one involved directly or indirectly in fruitful completion of this workshop on technology and innovation uh, first of all i uh, like to give my hearty vote of thanks to our honorable director professor dr minakshi jain who is also our workshop convener for her support in realizing this workshop and for gracing this workshop uh, with her presence we are very grateful to the ministry of housing and urban 
Affairs Housing for All for their approval on conducting this workshop. Our sincere thanks to Mr. Subhashish Das, uh, Director of Housing for All, for being a part of this workshop by uh, his uh, by delivering his cooperation. Uh, we also extend our sincere thanks to Mr. Sridhar Chitturi, Managing Director, Epitidco, for gracing this workshop with his presence and enlightening us with the performance of PMAU in Andhra Pradesh. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to express our deep gratitude to the expert speakers, Professor Dr. Shubhrata Chattopadhyay, Dr. B. Shashi Bhushan, for taking out time from their busy schedule and accepting our request on such a short notice. Uh, notice. Thank you very much, sirs, for giving us insights on creating sustainable, inclusive, and resilient built environments or human habitats, as you mentioned, through various skills and technologies. Professor Dr. Mantomani for gracing this occasion, uh, occasion with his presence. Although sir couldn't deliver his lecture, we are very grateful to him for accepting our invite. I would uh, also like to extend our heartfelt uh, regards to Mr. Raj Shekhar from APTITCO for his guidance and support uh, throughout the process of planning out this event. We would also like to thank Dr. Khatibullah Sheikh, Ms. Lavadnia, and Ms. Ananya Sinha from Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs for their cooperation in realizing this event. My sincere thanks to all the participants who have turned up in uh, great numbers and also those who are watching the live screening on our YouTube page. Sincere thanks to each one of you for your active participation. I'm uh, happy to express a vote of thanks to the deans, HODs, faculty members of SPA Vijaywara and all the officials of the Ministry uh, of Housing and Urban Affairs and AP TITCO for their presence in this workshop. My thanks also to all the beneficiaries for their presence in this workshop. I would also like to thank the IT team for their support in smooth conduction of this workshop. Finally, my sincere thanks to the coordinating team of this workshop, Professor Dr. Abdul Razak Mohammed, the chief coordinator, and Dr. Uma Shankar Vasina and Mr. Santosh Kumar, the coordinators for their endeavor towards successful completion of this workshop. And big thank you to you, uh, Dr. Uma Shankar Vasina, sir, for moderating this event as well. Once again, I thank all for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, one and all. Thank you all, sir. And ma'am. Thank you so much. Oh, sir, should I stop the stream? Yes. Yes, yes, sure.